All right, if you all resume your seats. We are continuing our uh, sermon series, uh, A Window into Jesus' Heart, which is based upon the Lord's Supper narratives from John chapter 13 to, verse, uh, to chapter 17. And uh, last week we covered the last portion of uh, John chapter 15, where Jesus shares with the apostles, I got to let you know. Because the world has hated me, the world's going to hate you. And um, there's going to be synagogues uh, that throw you out. Uh, there's going to be times that you're going to be arrested. There's going to be times that you're going to be flogged. You're going to face persecution. Uh, even some people are going to actually kill you thinking that they are doing something to glorify God. Now, that was not easy for Jesus to tell these disciples. That was not easy for these disciples to hear. However, one of the things that I mentioned last week, how, how fair it was that Jesus was honest with them. And so when those times came, they weren't surprised. And, uh, and Jesus also said at the end of chapter 15, I will send you the advocate, the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will help you to continue to testify to me. Now, here in chapter 16 that we're going to look at today, we start to learn more of what the Holy Spirit is going to do uh, for the disciples and for their ministry to the world. And one of the things that Jesus is going to communicate uh, to the disciples in chapter 16 is that they, there is so much more that they are going to learn from the Holy Spirit coming to them. And uh, that they have a lot of new lessons uh, that will be coming their way to help them better understand what God is up to, what Jesus has accomplished, what the Holy Spirit will do for them, how they will continue to navigate in Jesus' absence. And I want us in particular to pay close attention towards the end of chapter 16, where Jesus becomes very, very focused on communicating how the relationship for the disciples is going to change between them and God the Father. They're going to enter into a new experience with the Heavenly Father. And this is so exciting to Jesus. This is, this, this is something that Jesus is, is almost in sort of a euphoria about as he's talking with them about the Father. Because he mentions the Father nine times in the closing verses of this chapter. Nine times. The Father, the Father, the Father, the Father. He's so excited for these disciples to begin to share in the same sort of relationship that he has with the Father. And so uh, pay attention to that as we read through John chapter 16, verses 5. We're going to start in verse 5 through 33. But now I'm going away to the one who sent me to you. And not one of you is asking where I am going. Instead, you grieve because of what I have told you. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. Righteousness is available because I go to the Father, and you will see me no more. Judgment will come because the ruler of this world has already been judged. There's so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. 
He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. All that belongs to the Father is mine. This is why I said the Spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. In a little while you won't see me anymore, but a little while after that you will see me again. Some of the disciples asked each other, what does he mean when he says in a little while you won't see me, but then you will see me, and I am going to the Father. And what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand. Jesus realized they wanted to ask him about it. So he said, are you asking yourselves what I meant? I said in a little while, you won't see me again. I tell you the truth. You will weep and mourn over what is going to happen to me, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will suddenly turn to wonderful joy. It will be like a woman suffering the pains of labor when her child is born. Her anguish gives way to joy because she has brought a new baby into the world. Women, uh, you can tell me later whether that's true. <laughs> so you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. Then you will rejoice and no one can rob you of that joy. At that time, you won't need to ask me for anything. I tell you the truth, you will ask the Father directly, and he will grant your request because you use my name. You haven't done this before. Ask using my name, and you will receive, and you will have abundant joy. I have spoken of these matters in figures of speech, but soon I will stop speaking figuratively and will tell you plainly all about the Father. Then you will ask in my name, I'm not saying I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you dearly because you love me and believe that I came from God. Yes, I came from the Father into the world, and now I will leave the world and return to the Father. Then his disciples said, at last you are speaking plainly and not figuratively. Now we understand that you know everything, and there's no need to question you. From this, we believe that you came from God. Jesus asked, do you finally believe? But the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now when you will be scattered, each one going his own way, leaving me alone. Yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart. Because I have overcome the world. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Father, we ask now that the words of my mouth and meditation of all our hearts would be found pleasing and acceptable unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus talks about the fact that when he goes away, then the Holy Spirit can be sent to the disciples. Now, this is not because... Jesus and the Holy Spirit cannot coexist together with the disciples already. Uh, this, uh, the triune God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, coexist with each other at all times. It wasn't a spatial need for Jesus to leave the room, if you will, so that the Holy Spirit can enter. What Jesus is saying is the next phase of the plan has to happen with me going away, being crucified, being raised, and ascending, and then that cues the Holy Spirit to come on the scene and take over the next piece of the plan, this whole plan of salvation. And what he says that the Holy Spirit will do is that the Holy Spirit will come and convict the world of its sins, which its chief sin is that the world does not believe that Jesus has been sent by God to be the Savior and the Messiah of all of humanity. So, Jesus says that there is an advantage to his going away. What in the world could be the advantage? Well, this, that the next part of the plan begins. The next part of the plan has to go into action because if God is going to accomplish all that God has set out to do in the beginning, 
then this is the next phase of the plan, that Jesus goes away and the Holy Spirit comes. Now, let's think just for a minute uh, in a very practical way. Jesus' presence as an incarnated God-man had restrictions. He accepted physical limitations in being fully human. And those physical limitations were the fact that he was, he was controlled by time and space. And so when, the, when the Jesus was in Galilee, that's where he was. He couldn't be in Jerusalem at the same time he was in Galilee. Even the resurrected Jesus, who has transportability, and that really is a theological term, um, he is able to move at light speed between different places. He still can't be in two places at once. He does move at light speed from the garden where the tomb was that he was raised from uh, after talking to Mary to the road to Emmaus, walking with those two disciples, talking all day long about why the Messiah must suffer. He gets to their house in Emmaus, breaks bread, and all of a sudden they realize who it was that was with him. He vanishes, transportability, and then a little bit later is seen back in Jerusalem in the disciples' upper room. So he has special powers, but even then, he didn't have the capacity of what the Holy Spirit is able to do. And the Holy Spirit is able to dwell in any and all of us no matter where we are at any time. So one of the great advantages that Jesus has already emphasized in uh, the 14th chapter of John is the idea that God will be dwelling inside each of us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus' spirit goes with any and all of us. When you all leave here today, Jesus continues to walk with you wherever you are. And so this is clearly uh, one of the great advantages that comes to us in Jesus going away and sending the Holy Spirit. But the other thing that Jesus talks about is the power of the Spirit to convict people of their sin. And of course, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit fell upon those 120 disciples in Jerusalem, and uh, those disciples were able to then speak in foreign tongues so that everybody, no matter where they were from, could hear the gospel preached and proclaimed in their own native language. What happened during the course of that day is that Peter's message and the disciples' message to those who were gathered in Jerusalem, they were convicted. They were convicted by the Holy Spirit that they had... had um, chanted and ch and called for the crucifixion of Jesus and they were wrong they all of a sudden realized they were wrong how did they realize they were wrong well one of the things that they were recognizing is that the Holy Spirit is doing something in these disciples these disciples then testified to the fact that Jesus had been raised and that um, many of them had seen him for themselves and the raising of Jesus was a validation of all that Jesus had proclaimed. And then the Holy Spirit, as a prosecuting attorney, says, and the reason he ended up crucified was because you called for his crucifixion when you were outside of Pilate's house, chanting at the urging of the religious leadership. And the people, it says, were cut to the heart. They were cut to the heart. And they asked Peter in Acts chapter 2, verse 37 through 38, they asked him, um, they said, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent of your sin, turn to God, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, it is true historically that that angry mob outside of Pilate's house on the day of Jesus' crucifixion uh, 
created the sort of atmosphere that caused Pilate, even though he didn't want to order Jesus' execution, to go on through with it. However, we know by how the Holy Spirit works conviction in our own hearts that Jesus hung on that cross because we're all guilty of sin. We all needed a Savior to die for our sinfulness. I remember when I was uh, summer before ninth grade, starting to study God's word more, encouraged by my brother's spiritual growth, I read a verse, Romans 5, 8, that says, but God proves his own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And I was convicted in that moment by that verse that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. He died on the cross for me even before, long before I would ever feel convicted for my sin and want God to do something about that. Now, here's the interesting thing that's different about conviction and guilt. Okay? Conviction, when we feel convicted, we, want, we feel drawn to God. That the Holy Spirit is convincing us of something we've done wrong, but it doesn't repel us away from God. Because simultaneously, the Holy Spirit is able to communicate to us, God loves you, and God will forgive you. Come back to God, and God will make this right. That's conviction. Guilt, which is the language of the devil, repels us from God. Guilt shames us. Guilt pushes us away from God. Tells us that we can't talk to God about this because God is so angry with this that God will never forgive us for that. That is not the language of the Holy Spirit. The language of the Holy Spirit is conviction. And when I felt convicted that summer, right before going into ninth grade, my response was to get on my knees and to say, Lord, here's my life. You, you, you love me better than anyone in any, anything else. You were willing to die for my sin, to cleanse me from my unrighteousness so that I could be in relationship with you for all eternity. Have my life. I wasn't repelled. I was drawn in. And that is what the Holy Spirit is going to do. Now, when uh, in verse 13, uh, Jesus says something very interesting. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. The apostles heard Jesus say that to them, and we honestly believe from the grammar of that word, that pronoun you, Y-O-U, I, uh, the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. Jesus was speaking specifically to the disciples, not specifically to you and me. Now, don't let that make you feel cheated, because I'm going to share something with you here right now that blew my mind. So, the Holy Spirit leads these apostles into all truth, and from that, we get the New Testament. We get the Gospels. We get the Acts. We get the letters. We get the book of Revelation, which reveals how all things will end. So yes, the apostles were led to know all truth and inspired by the Holy Spirit to record that truth so that we have the benefit today that the Holy Spirit leads us to understand what that truth was that the Holy Spirit revealed to the apostles. We have this great gift, approximately 700 to 800 pages, depending on font size, page size, and versions of your Bible, that is there for us to read under the influence of the Holy Spirit so we know what God revealed to those apostles, the all truth. Now, 
He leads them into all truth. And then what uh, Jesus wants to emphasize is that he is going to connect these apostles and the disciples that follow to the Father. Um, nine times, I said, he mentions the Father. And uh, uh, I hope you all have at some point in your life read something from Brennan Manning. Um, he has a host of books um, that speak of the Father's love for us, but one in particular is Abba Father, um, or Abba's Child. It's called Abba's Child. you got to read that book. But in that book, he says this, and the quote's up on the screen. Jesus, the beloved Son, does not hoard this experience for himself, meaning the experience of the relationship between the Father and the Son. He invites and calls us to share the same intimate and liberating relationship. Jesus wants us to know what it is to be a child of the Father just as he knows what it is to be the child of the Father. Uh, he, is, <laughs> um, he, he is not saying, hey, you're going to become adopted children and stepchildren to the Father. You're going to refer to the Father as stepdad or foster dad. Um, no, he is saying, you're going to find out that the Father loves you dearly as much as the Father loves me. And you're going to find out that the Father wants as much you to have as much access to him as I have to him. And so you're going to pray in my name. And, and when you do that, it, 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 it says to you that you're not just asking as an outsider. It says to you that because of what I have done on your behalf, you can ask boldly whatever you need and want from God because he is your father. Now, I want to wrap this idea up saying two things. First off, one of the things that we do in life is we search for our identity. Right now, we live in a world that says, you've got to go earn or prove your identity. You've got to either be so successful, so powerful, so wealthy, so popular uh, that you come to believe you have an identity um, that is valuable. Jesus wants your identity to be this. You are a child of the Father. And there is no greater thing that you could know or understand about yourself than the idea that God made you intending you to know you are God's child. You are forever God's child who loves you dearly. Now, the second thing I want to say is my uh, oldest son, Nate, gave me a vision of what this looks like when he was a year and a half old. We were closing out a worship service in Lubbock, Texas, at Westminster Presbyterian Church. I was an associate pastor there. And the senior pastor, we had just finished the last hymn, the senior pastor comes to the front to give the benediction. They open up the back doors, and all of a sudden, Nate, a year and a half old, starts running down the aisle, holding a big red balloon, going, Daddy, 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 Daddy. And it was so loud, it was so constant that it stopped the past, uh, senior pastor's benediction right in the middle. And um, he, he said to Nate as he was running up all the way to the steps and was crawling up the steps of the chancel, uh, he said, hey, bud, what's up? And, and uh, Nate just ran right by him, didn't even, didn't even give him a nod, and runs right to me and jumps up in my arms. And I scoop him up. That 
is how Jesus wants us to come to God the Father in his name every day. Nate was confident of his identity. He was confident that he was daddy's son. And he lived to exercise that to the fullest extent. Let's pray. God, we call you daddy. (laughs) That's how Jesus taught us to pray. Pray to Abba, pray to daddy. Our identity is that we are a child of the Father in heaven. We have access to you through the name of Jesus. You don't need to be reminded that we have access to you. We need to be reminded. So when we pray in that name, we are reminded that Jesus has made the way for us to fully engage in relationship with you. Lord, I pray. I pray that we value the gift of the Spirit. I pray we value the truth that has been made known to us by the Spirit's work and the apostles in giving us the New Testament scriptures. Father, I pray that we are allowing you to draw us ever nearer to yourself for us to know more and more all the good blessings that come with being your children. And Lord, let us be like Jesus. Jesus, as Brennan Manning said, didn't hoard this relationship with the Father to himself. He could have. But Jesus was willing to take great risk to come to here to earth to accept humanity humanity's clothing upon him all because he wanted more and more people to have the relationship that they were welcome to have with the father and so lord